Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We're an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And today we have the great delight to be in the liberal Upper West Side of Manhattan uh, with Professor Todd Gitlin of Columbia University. He's the chair of the communications department there. He is also a legendary figure from the new left of the 1960s, uh, where he was the first president of the Students for a Democratic Society. Third president, okay, but he was up there. He was in with Tom Hayden and all those great rebel activists of the 60s and now as we go forward uh, in our politics and try to make sense of what's going on uh, here in the spring of 2016 with Donald Trump uh, in the ascendancy and, and his kind of uh, right-wing politics and populist appeal uh, and, and on, the, on the left we have Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton uh, we want to try to make sense of all that what's going on in the world and what better way to do that than with one of the great critical intellectuals of our time, uh, Todd Gitlin, who's a prolific writer and thinker. And so we are at home with him in his Morningside Heights apartment. And uh, I, I knew we were on the liberal upper, upper West Side when I got off the subway and saw a Bernie Sanders button. So I said, okay, we are, <laughs> this is the heart of the liberal. Uh, and, and you've actually, a friend of mine in this yes. Refer to it as the upper left side. Oh, the upper left side. There you go, folks. There you go. So, uh, what's your analysis, just to start us off on the situation today? Do you, first of all, you think Bernie Sanders has a chance to get the nomination? Almost certainly not. Uh, I think he's done a lot of good uh, by pushing Hillary to take economic distress more seriously, and he's excited people. Uh, he excites more young men than young women and some old timers as well. Uh, but he certainly stretched the boundaries of what was discussable, and that's a great, that's an achievement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are. Let me just oh, add, if I may, about him that I, I what, what I hope he does now um, is to uh, make sure or do everything he can to make sure that the people he is excited don't go away. Mm. What I mean, I mean two things. Number one, that they don't stay home on election day, mm. whoever the Democratic candidate is. So it's going to be a, the, we're we're heading into an emergency. Mm. We have a, um, a a a a mad dog, uh, nativist bigot, uh, almost certainly the Republican nominee. Um, there are times when you postpone other concerns in order to uh, avoid drowning. And uh, so people have to step up and whether if, if it takes holding your nose, mm. hold your nose, whatever, but cast ballots. The second thing I think he needs to do um, is to uh, encourage the growth of a continuing caucus, movement, uh, array, apparatus, whatever, uh, within the Democratic Party, consisting of people who uphold his values, who will run for local office, uh, city councils, uh, mayors, governors, uh, congressmen, senators, uh, in order to be the equivalent on the left of the Tea Party. The, you know, our crowd, our people of our disposition have, have, have not been as dogged, as disciplined, uh, as, as patient as, their, as our equivalents on the right. And so today, it's, it's not just that the, the, the Republicans control the Senate, it's that they also control 60% of the states. They control the governorships and the state assemblies, and that's where you know, pieces of, of onerous legislation like the attack on abortion rights in Texas, for example, that's where those decisions are made. So I think he, he should uh, help um, uh, and, and actively be on the side of attempts to recruit uh, 
other people to run for lower offices and keep them, uh, help them with, uh, uh, he has money that will be left over from his campaign, help them with, with uh, uh, show up support. So he has, he has more work to do. So you don't think that there is still, that Bernie doesn't have a legitimate chance because they say that the states going forward are a lot more favorable to him than the South. The South has historically been very conservative. Uh, they will probably vote Republican in the general election. So right. if, if Bernie gets California, if he gets some of those big states in the West, he might actually still be in this. And do you think that the media is being unfair to him? I heard that Hillary Clinton is getting twice as much coverage in the media. So so what do you think about that as a media expert? Okay, so um, first of all, as I understand it, the Democratic Party, I mean, the, both parties set up the rules mm. to accommodate the, those who were in power in the party at the time. So the Republicans set up the rules mm. to require this 1,237 ballot, which now Trump is complaining, 1,237 votes. Uh, the Democrats set it up with a lot of superdelegates, um, so who are who are party people, and they're they're going to be loyal to Hillary as they're loyal to the the party uh, standbys. So uh, if it were simply a straight up um, popularity contest in the primaries, it would be a different story. But but that is not the story we're in. Um, uh, as for, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the second question you asked me. Yeah. In terms of the media, do you think that they're biased against yeah, yeah. Bernie? Yeah. Um, I think initially they didn't take him seriously. Mm. Uh, that's that's clear. Uh, and um, uh, even I think the um, uh, the public editor of the New York Times, who's a straight arrow uh, ombuds person. Uh, came to that conclusion early on herself, mm -hmm. Margaret Sullivan. Um, uh, but I think they turned around um, starting when it was clear that he was accumulating support. And so at some point, I would say in the fall, I think they... Um, um, I think they remedied the imbalance. Uh, you know, I've tr I know Clinton supporters who think that they have been picking and clawing at her incessantly and obsessively. Um, and, you know, they can also make a case. I mean, this, this would go back, way back to the time when Whitewater was made, uh, you know, a momentous issue. Uh, and the, I think, rather egregious way they handled the Monica Lewinsky moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't think there's any love lost between the New York Times. They're still going after her. They had these long pieces that mm -hmm. the Times did about Benghazi and so on. And the, and the, the email, or as, as Bernie memorably said, the da your damn emails, they, mm -hmm. you know, go to town on that. So I, I, I actually don't agree with that criticism. Well, I want to uh, focus this not just on uh, the news events of today, but this our, our show is about education and the arts and social change. And I saw, for example, that you are also a novelist, uh, and uh, that's interesting, I think. And um, it's I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation, Todd, because there's so much I want to you know, talk to you about in terms of like the 60s and what was going on at that time. You were very much a part of that, of, of the new left, of the radical left, of the raising of consciousness, of, of people who felt that, uh, you know, that uh, peace and love was the way to go and to move away from this kind of war mentality going against the Vietnam War. You led one of the first protests against the Vietnam War. How do we... Yeah. You, yeah. How do we see like the arc in terms of like people that are uh, going with Bernie now? That's they, they, you know, there's a whole line of progressive uh, thought and, and, and activity that goes from like the 1890s with the new progressive movement to the 1930s with the with the labor uh, uprisings and into the new left, uh, which was your period, uh, one of the main, and then the Occupy movement. How do we make sense of this and connect the dots politically to what's going on? and educate the public that there are, uh, you know, a, the, the, w there is a better kind of world to live in, that we can't just be, we don't have to be just stuck in, in the way things are. Well, that's a tall order. Let, let me, i just sort of throw out a few items. Uh, so first of all, the, the, these, are v these are very different yeah. movements uh, corresponding to conditions of different periods. So for example, let me just confine myself to the 30s versus the 60s. The th in the 30s, the, the, the thrust of the left was labor. Mm 
and and was extraordinarily successful in uh, making labor unions legitimate, uh, in uh, building up their strength, um, so that labor became a pillar of the Democratic Party, starting in the administration of Franklin Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and remained so through the 1960s. Um, so the left was, of course, there were intellectuals in the left, importantly, uh, which is always the true, always true for in politics, especially left-wing politics. But the the uh, there was a working class base. Now that was weakened significantly by the uh, exclusion of black voters. Uh, most uh, uh, conspicuously in the South, where you had counties that had uh, thousands of black residents and, you know, 12 registered voters and so on. So one of the great achievements of the 60s, the early 60s, uh, of the civil rights movement was to uh, actually go a long way toward rectifying that oppression mm -hmm. and overcome what were, in fact, terror states that, that uh, dominated the Deep South. Um, however, um, so that was, so on the civil rights front, the movements were enormously successful. Um, and then, uh, and, and part of the reason was that there was such a large mobilization of middle class people in behalf of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement began, little known fact, quite unpopular, but it became more popular in the course of the early 60s. Uh, and, uh, you know, many, you know, obviously the civil rights movement was its own uh, creature and it was, uh, you know, extraordinarily successful in in uh, rolling back much of, not all, obviously all, but much of the uh, appalling uh, racism of, of the previous centuries. Um, then came the war. And I, I think, by the way, if the war had, if the Vietnam War had not accelerated, we would have had a very different 60s. We would have had a triumphant uh, left. Uh, we would have had a president in office, now I'm talking about Johnson, who was a reformer for, with weaknesses, but uh, was a genuine reformer, and I think sincerely so. Uh, who, and the great society was, uh, his domestic measures, were actually uh, immensely important. I mean, if we think of, you know, you mentioned education, aid to education came out of that period. Um, Medicare came out of that period. Uh, a, public uh, radio and television came out of that period. Uh, the immigration reform, great immigration reform of enormous consequence, came out of that period. So that's what the 60s would have looked like had it not been for this insane war that Johnson committed himself to. So then came the great uh, uh, upwelling of the anti-war movement, and uh, which I would say overall was successful. Uh, obviously, the war didn't end in the way we wanted it to. That is, it took many more years than it should have to end it. It killed, you know, a couple of million people in Southeast Asia, and so on. Um, uh, but uh, the movement did what it could, and and actually did have make a big dent. In the meantime, the spirit of these especially the spirit of the civil rights movement, uh, became generalized. So uh, all kinds of other people who felt uh, uh, that their rights were suppressed, that their dignity was impinged, was, was contained, damaged, women, gays, uh, brown, people of color, brown, yellow, etc., cetera, uh, all um, rose up in, 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 in a, an attempt to make for more equality. Um, and something even more uh, astonishing happened, which was there was a, a broad scale revolt against the abuse of illegitimate authority or against authority in general. So this is the time when, uh, you know, pa patients uh, decided not to let doctors carry out their operations in, uh, secretly from them. Uh, when uh, all kinds of ideas about running classrooms differently emerged, when all kinds of skepticism about government emerged. Uh, so the culture changed. So in general, I would, I would sum this up by saying that, that overall, the principal achievements of the 60s were in the transformation of the culture, but not in the transformation of the economic system. Mm 
so we were then in the 60s. We were sort of at coming toward the end of a great boom period that began in 1945, when the U.S. was basically uncontested as a uh, as a wealthy and powerful uh, economy. When trade unions had made enormous advances, so by the mid 50s, a, a fully a third of American workers belonged to unions. Unions did become central to the Democratic Party. Uh, for better and worse, and um, uh, but that that pretty much crunched to an end uh, in the early 70s, uh, starting with the with the oil crisis of 73. And since then, we've been living in uh, in a uh, in an economy of uh, increasing e increasing inequality. It's a plutocratic economy. Uh, in which um, both Democrats and Republicans have colluded uh, with Wall Street to to uh, look benignly on as mm -hmm. corporate life becomes more financialized, more control mm -hmm. in the hands of financial institutions, especially banks, leading to the great meltdown of mm -hmm. 07, 08. Uh, so, um, so one of the huge differences between the movement of the 30s and the movement of the 60s can be seen very easily if you look at the what's become of the white vote, especially the white working class vote. You know, it's a remarkable fact that since 1976, that is the first presidential election, uh, after the, um, a, a, after the, 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 the enormous transformations in uh, civil rights and women's rights, the first contested election, the white vote, the, uh, I think this is the white male vote that I'm talking about, has been basically fixed in America, from Jimmy Carter you know, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, Walter Mondale, to Mike Dukakis, to, uh, to Bill Clinton, uh, and then subsequently, you know, Obama gets the same, got the same percentage of the white vote that Jimmy Carter did. The reason Obama was able to win is that the country's less white than it used to be. So, uh, so thus, it's not entirely surprising that a very significant proportion of white men, in particular, uh, have gone over to Donald Trump. Because they're not, I mean, they're, they're berserk uh, and they're dangerous, but their, uh, in, their feeling of instability, the feeling that, that the ground's been rocking underneath them, uh, is, related to real, is related to real conditions. Their incomes have not gone up. And this is, by the way, not only true of the of the whites without college educations, but it's true of white, even college graduates. Um, they, it's all been stagnant now for uh, for uh, their proportion of the national income has been overcome. I mean, just you look at the New York skyline and you see yeah. what's going on. I can see outside your window very nicely yeah, here. You can't see with the buildings I'm going to mention, but you know the, the city is now filling up with skyscraper residences, which uh, containing condominiums that are being bought by foreign uh, uh, billionaires. Uh, Russians, Chinese, who knows? Often in secret, they're, they're, the apartments are, are are owned by shell corporations. Um, so the very skyline of New York has been transformed in a plutocratic direction. Um, uh, I mean, just go anywhere down, you know, from Central Park on in through Midtown, and you and you'll see it. You see these these immense skyscraper apartment buildings where, uh, you know, where the apartments cost 30 or $40 million. And the consequent closing of small businesses who can't pay the rent. Well, for sure. And you can walk up and down Broadway here and see uh, even, you know, re reasonably successful small businesses that have shut down. I mean, there's a lot of for rent signs all the way up and down Broadway because the, rent, th the, the rents are insane. So, so cities like, by the way, like Manhattan, if we just talk about Manhattan, or San Francisco, these have become uh, cities for wealthy people, and the poor are pushed out. Here. What are we still doing here? What are we still doing here? What are we gonna? <laughs> well, we're you know we we live you know we're, we're, you know the poor the the poor are pushed out to the outer boroughs and sometimes out out of the city altogether. So all this is to say that the the political condition, the political economic conditions mm. that have been conducive to the rise of Donald Trump have been in the making for a long time. And they've been in the making 
um, in part, and, and of course, the, it's not like the Republican Party just went insane this mm -hmm. year, uh, because all of them are uh, unable to come to grips with how this happened. They, uh, they're all anti-union. I mean, the crushing, the, 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 the bashing and, and crushing of unions is a central part of the story of how this country turns so badly to the right. And this is not an accident. This is because, this is not because workers don't want to join unions. It's because the laws now uh, require that unions permit corporations, management, to campaign against unionization. In the in the in the workplace, mm -hmm. and then so they have tons of money to spend, and they 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 warp the debate, and they succeed in convincing workers not to unionize. So now, you know, in, as I mentioned, in in the mid '50s, about a third or more of the American workforce was unionized. Now, if we look at the private workforce today, it's about seven percent. And if you look at the total workforce, I think it's about 11. So uh, 11, in other words, one third the uh, strength that uh, that America saw in 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 you know 60 years ago. So in a situation like that, the 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 car the power cards have been held by the plutocrats. The the Republican Party has been their party, and and the the the, you know, the fusion or the the alliance between the plutocrats and evangelical Christians mm -hmm. has been, which, which arose under Ronald Reagan, has been the dominant force uh, in American politics now since 1980. So now it's you know, failed to find the, the next man on the white horse. Mm -hmm. You know, they had Reagan, they had, they had George W. Bush, uh, and they failed to find anybody this year who could hold it together. So instead, uh, they opened the way for this uh, egregious demagogue mm. to uh, even, you know, frighten the pants off the, the Republican establishment itself. Mm. Well, um, I am the son of a union guy, my dad. I grew up in a working class environment. If I look out your window over here, I could see Edgewater, New Jersey, which is where I grew up. And my dad was in the uh, IATSE union, which was the uh, union of theater and stage people working backstage. He became president of that union and was able to buy a house when I was 13 years old because of, you know, the union. Order. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, s s strong union jobs in the in that period c produced what was called the family wage. That is to say, a single wage earner mm. could buy a house, go to the suburbs. By the way, this was a, it was a lot easier for white people than people of color. Uh, that's a long story. Yes. But so it wasn't like. Everybody got to do that, but uh, yeah, you could, you know, you, you could be, you could work in the post office or some, you know, have a stable job like that, which was unionized, mm. uh, which was enduring, and with low mortgage rates, which went, especially went for veterans after World War II, uh, you could have, a, you know, a, a perfectly decent life. Mm. No longer possible. Now, and here's another interesting from my family background. My grandfather on my father's side had a cousin who married a DuPont. And he, the DuPont <laughs> happened to be the uh, daughter of Irene DuPont, who created the uh, American Liberty League in 1934, which was the first uh, conservative think tank. And that was sort of the prototype. And this is this is a side of the family that we haven't seen much of. This is the rich relatives from Delaware. <laughs> you know, I said to my father, the, the the family ever stay together for, with the rich side? He said one time they came to visit, but there was an argument with my grandfather, and then the Cadillac, the, you know, went streaming away. And I, <laughs> he said, well, the people on the block never saw a Cadillac before. The Cadillac came up to the house, and there was anyway. It's a long story. But this American Liberty League which was created in 1934, essentially claimed to be nonpartisan, but it wasn't. They were trying... Very extremely, extreme right wing. 
So what, what is the role of those, of those think tanks in terms of even now you have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, you have uh, Mount Pelerin Society. A uh, wonderful book that I read was by Kim Phillips Fine called Invisible Hands, The Businessmen's Crusade Against the New Deal, and it really opened my eyes to how much propaganda has been going on uh, in education and think tanks, and, um, and, and has the left ever countered that effectively? Uh, in a word, no. Um, the the Chamber of Commerce I would put in a different category. That's a lobby group. Um, it's not it's not really a think tank. But it's an interesting story about how this came about. Um, the, the business class, the top business class, panicked uh, as a consequence of what happened in the '60s. They they saw all these rebellious young people. They saw you. Yeah, they saw, they saw... And your buddies, Tom Hayden. And they, and they saw, moreover, that the legitimacy of capitalism was, yeah. was on the skids, mm -hmm. that uh, they saw the radical youth, uh, who were often their own children. Yeah. Um, and so they began to think in the early 70s that they needed to invest in countering this tendency. Mm -hmm. I mean, they anticipated... After all... We were, I mean, my parents were high school teachers, you know, sort of straight middle class people. Uh, but people like me and those who had more money were, were to be groomed for, their, for them, for their work, for their structures, their, their way of life. And so when we went into revolt, uh, they were appalled and they set out to make sure it didn't happen again. So what that entailed, long story short, was that a lot of money uh, came out of certain right-wing fortunes to create, to, to rectify, as they saw it, the political imbalance, uh, as they saw it, uh, in universities, in media, in cultural institutions. They created the think tanks uh, of various shades of right wing, the American Enterprise Institute, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation. These are the people who were not so much thinkers as drafters of legislation for Reagan. Uh, in 1980, they just, wrote just his real, real quick, when I, when I found out that the Coors family was behind the Heritage Foundation, yeah. I switched to Budweiser right away. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Coors was one of the early sign-ons, um, and Heritage was very important. Uh, the Koch brothers, who now have become notorious, were the principal funders of the Cato Institute. Um, and uh, so, uh, they, uh, th they wrote books, they... Uh, they created the they created an infrastructure, so you could make a career in that world. You could be a, a sort of young hotshot conservative, let's say, working on a college paper, and uh, when you were recognized by them, then you know they'd give you they throw money at you. They would throw they started periodicals that these people could write for, um, and that apparatus continues. They train people on, on their way into politics. Uh, it was an extraordinarily successful uh, exercise in, in infrastructure construction. They did far better with that than they did with rebuilding bridges and roads, uh, or let alone water pipes. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, so that was, and I know this sounds very uh, sort of sinister, uh, you know, behind the scenes, back roomish, but it, it is amply documented that this happened. I, it's such a delight to meet you, uh, Todd, because I feel like I stumbled onto this intellectual left in New York uh, somehow, uh, beginning, as I was telling you earlier, uh, when I was going to NYU. I went to a very radical program for English education that prepared me to be an English professor uh, in, in NYU, and I got exposed to these ideas of social justice and teaching, you know, with Palo Freire and that kind of thing. You teach for a better world, a more loving world, a more kind world, a more fair and just world world. And then I discovered the village and I discovered places like Judson Memorial Church, which is extremely radical and spiritual at the same time and cultural. Okay. Then I got into the village independent Democrats, which was about as far to the left in the Democratic Party as you could be. And and from there and, and other, other uh, people, I, I met Stanley Aronowitz, one of the your colleagues here on the far left in New York, uh, and just being around him. So, but 
my question now is for people who haven't been exposed to this, I, these ideas, who haven't had the benefit of that, because if you look at our educational system, it's become increasingly uh, like training people for work instead of liberating them or instead of really exposing them to humanities and culture and ideas and politics. Most people, a lot of people out there watching even maybe don't even know this stuff. How do we have the kindness and patience to, to bear, and some of these people are in our families and people are in our communities, and, and how do we educate in a way that's compassionate and well this, this also uh, how many hours do you have uh, you know the, the, my, the time when I was young was a time uh, the, the, the watchword was affluence now I didn't grow up especially affluent but um, Increasingly, you know, a substantial number of this booming college population did. Um, I, I never heard of anybody graduating from college with debt. Mm -hmm. it, 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 alien concept. Um, and moreover, the, because there was a lot of slack in the economy, um, people could drop out and in the back of their minds, whether consciously or not, they knew they could drop back in. So you had a, you know, a lot of people leaving school to work in the civil rights movement, organizing the poor, as, which was one of, our, one of the SDS projects in the middle 60s. Uh, or they could become hippies and so on. You know, we were talking a moment ago about real estate. Real, uh, the real estate story here is crucial. You could live in the Lower East Side for $50 a month in the late 60s. You know, dropping out had a cushion under it. You know, you didn't live that well. It might be a cold water flat, but you had a roof. Okay, that world's gone. You know, the, there, you, now you're dealing with, you know, condos with mortgages of many thousand dollars a month. And so that world, now some of it is still possible. Some of what I'm describing is possible, you know, in the outer reaches of the city, but increasingly not. So, uh, and you know what the college debt situation is. So you felt, it wasn't just that, it, that the living was easier, it's that you felt uh, a, a, a kind of a, a, a cushion for freedom. Mm. It, that, that, you know, life w did, was not gonna be so onerous. And even though those of us who actually didn't want to go into the, the, the mainstream world, who didn't want to work on Madison Avenue or work, you know, do Pentagon research or something. Um, as I say, we, we, we didn't feel we were uh, going to starve as a result. So, so, so now we're facing a very different condition with a very different mentality about it. Um, where you know the, the people talk use a sort of vulgar word precarity. Your life is going to be a precarious. That is, you're going to go from freelance job to freelance job. I mean, and that's true for a lot of our students, especially uh, in one of my posts is in the journalism school, and you have a, a lot of people who graduate from the journalism school, and you know they're of good spirit, but you know you know how the jobs for journalists are not easy to come by. So a lot of them end up, they do this startup, uh, internet startup, and it fails, and they try another one, and, so, some, and they get by, but they get by uh, without stable employment. And um, so they, there's a sense of that the, the horizon for them is, is, more, is more diminished than it was in my time. Uh, it, it's not, you know, there are a lot of people who want to take chances as entrepreneurs, but there are not a lot of people who want to take chances with, you know, sort of a more adventurous life, a more, uh, more um, uh, rambunctious or, or uh, ab you know, odd life. Um, so, um, they, you know, none of that is good for the spirit. Um, I don't think it's very good for the culture either, but that's another, you know, that's another whole story we could talk about. Um, uh, but something else has changed, which is also important. Um, you know, in the 60s, people were getting thrown out of school, high school for if their boy's hair was, you know, a little bit long, or if the girl's short skirt was a little bit uh, short, or, uh, sh yeah, short. And um, uh, people were getting, you know, long prison sentences for smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and and if you were a uh, if your views were radical or if you were black, um, but you didn't have an easy time um, breaking into the mainstream of the culture. Music was an exception, but uh, and that was important. But you 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 lived a cramped life. So in that setting, and of course people were you know in the, especially in the South. Um, if you supported civil rights, white, whether you're white or black, you know, you could get killed for it. Or in any case, you could get thrown out of school for it, beaten up for it, and so on. So uh, the upshot was that, it, that it, you felt that in order to get breathing room, you had to dramatically change the culture. So you had to rebel mm. in a huge way. You know, if you were going to be attacked as, uh, you know, to use the term of the time, a nigger lover for being a white student who supported civil rights in Texas, I'm talking here about people I knew, mm -hmm. then you might as well, you might as well call yourself a communist because the, the consequences were going to be, were the, going to be the same. Your, your parents were going to disown you. Mm -hmm. You're going to be, you know, you could be evicted, et cetera. All kinds of, of, of bad things would happen. Now, the culture's changed dramatically and in no small part because of what happened in the 60s. So I would say that today the mainstream culture is a rebellion culture. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a rebel. You can say anything. You know, I don't know if you can put it on TV, but I can yeah. say... No, yeah, oops, sorry. You have to bleep that out. Right, that's a that's a small holdover of the old of the old order. Well, George Carlin said, "There's seven dirty words you can't say." I know, I know. Uh, you know, if I'm Donald Trump, I can say anything I damn please and run for president. So what what this means is that it's in a, in a curious way harder to be a rebel because the culture prizes rebellion. Okay. When well, you mentioned Trump, I just thought of something. Do you think the rise of Trumpism could also be an effect of our edu the educational crisis? The pe people have not been educated to think critically that they'll accept this? I don't know if it's a matter of not being taught to think critically. Um, I think it is true that um, they're not being able to think logically. They're not being able to... Um, understand, for example, what science is. Mm -hmm. So they think you can just, you can doubt climate change because you're, you're suspicious of scientists, which is complete garbage. You have a whole political party that's committed to falsehood about yeah. climate. Whole point of political party. All the, the, you know, the rational people. There was a, this appalling moment in the 2012 campaign when one of the debate so-called interviewers asked the, the Republican candidates to raise their hands if he, if they denied climate change. They all raised their hands. You know, uh, I mean, Marco Rubio is just as, uh, you know, intelligence impaired on this question as Trump. Uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, and I don't know that, I don't know what John Kasich is saying about climate, but he certainly doesn't say or do much about it. Mm. So all this is to say that I think the education system has failed uh, gravely and in, in quite a number of ways, but I don't want to simply pin this. It's not all a function of conservatives by any means. Mm. And in fact, I think there was a serious default uh, on the left that began in, late 60s, early 70s. And that was the uh, f the breakdown of faith that it was possible to make general statements about truth. And what I'm talking about is the rise and, uh, of a relatively uh, severe form of what came to be called identity politics, in which uh, we could not have a discussion about truth, let's say, about the truth of some claims about the, the nature of wealth or the climate change or whatever, because uh, if you or I are white guys, then we are privileged. And if we're privileged uh, by virtue of our skin, then nobody actually has to deal with arguments. Okay, so so we don't any long, you know, so and this, you know, I know uh, there are conservatives who go on about this, but some things are true, even though it's conservatives who go on about it. There has been a an influx of garbage into the universities, and I think it impairs thinking. 
So if we're taught that, you know, that science is a colonialist imposition on the world, which is, which is a certain line of thought that's developed uh, out of the 60s, sometimes more intelligently argued than others, then it should be no surprise that, you know, we don't have a counter to, uh, to, the, to creationists, let's say, about, uh, you know, about the, the origin of species. Uh, that we that we lack, um, you know, that, that the the in many of our departments, including especially and egregiously humanities departments, yeah. we're we're taught to relativize everything, um, and which means not only not being able to make sense, but also writing in tongues. I mean, writing writing garbage that uh, is only, it's a cloistered language that, that, yeah. that, you know, that insiders speak. It mm. completely isolates the univer people with a university of education. I mean, if you, you know, I mean, just pick up any academic journal and you'll yeah. see what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's been, f p even though the people who have, who've entered into that intellectual universe would, would say that they are um, left wing, mm. I think they've actually helped undermine the left as a rational position to occupy. They have uh, disabled uh, a, a good deal of the left. You, you should not, when you go through a university, be incapacitated to talk to people who don't have a university education. But if you, you know, you read the stuff I'm talking about, you know exactly what I mean. How could they ever, how can they ever talk to an angry, white, dispossessed, working class person if they can't make themselves understood? Oh, that's so true. That's so true. And I notice also from being in conservative um, environments uh, versus very progressive, liberal, academic, intellectual spaces, there seems to be, with the conservatives, tend to be more chummy. They tend to be more, hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Eye to eye, face to face kind of thing, where I notice on the left, it's like, it can be very splintering. It can be very like, you know, you, you find the one thing that separates you and then you just go at that and then people don't talk. Well, yeah, I mean, in this way, this year is an aberration for the, for the conservatives because yeah. as you say, until now, they were actually far more congenial with each other. And that's partly because they're not uh, that democratic, small d. So they like a th hierarchy. They had a uh, they had a top down uh, approach, so yeah, they could afford to be more jovial. Um, the the but the left goes for look, looking for difference, so you know it's the circular si f uh, firing squad, and uh, you know so people are in their silos, uh, and the divisions are grave. And again, you know, I don't, I just want to, I don't want to pin this only on the university. I mean, I think the culture is, is not conducive to clear thought. The media are obviously, uh, dis, dis, uh, disinclined to, uh, make thinking easier or more accessible. Uh, but, you know, so many things in the culture are, operating to, uh, or have been operating to, uh, to avert the development of a, of a deliberative spirit that can cut across lines. One of the things, Todd, in my own teaching practice, and which also has to do with our show, it's important to us as dialogue, to create dialogical spaces and to build community. Uh, all my classrooms are democracies. You know, we've, from day one, my English classes, college English classes, we, we get into a circle, and very often it's the first time my students have ever sat in a circle. They're used to sitting in rows and being taught in a very authoritarian way. So for them, it's kind of liberating, but also it can be difficult for them who haven't they haven't had practice in, in just dialogue and conversations, looking each other in the eye, keeping those conversations going in small groups, and it makes me feel great to be in a room where I'm liberating that convivial dialogical spirit. Back in 2002, I created an open dialogue in a bookstore in Hoboken called Symposia Bookstore. Claudia and I live in Hoboken. And it met once a week, and anybody could come. And it was just the most 
open radical conversation that just went on. It was supposed to be from like 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock. Often it went to like 11 o'clock till midnight because people just enjoyed being in a space together and sharing uh, th things and ideas. And when people know that their troubles are not just theirs but other people's troubles and then how can we fix these problems, but also how can we just have fun being together and telling stories and being in connection and community and overcoming that alienation that they talk a lot about in the Frankfurt School, people like Herbert Marcuse and, 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 and Eric Fromm, you know, the automaton personalities that we see around us. Uh, any thoughts about that? Because the 60s was a time of community. People were coming together and does it seem that identity, even personal identity, can come from being in community, that when you're around like-minded people, then you could think better and you can grow? Where are the spaces for people to be together today? Well, it's complicated. I mean, let's not get too romantic about the great old days. I mean, I, I, mean, I, loved, I loved them, and we, certainly we had our community yeah. in the new left, but you know, our community was not everybody's community, and um, even within the new left, there were significant you know, ruptures of community over race, over over sex, eventually over sexuality. Uh, I mean, it wasn't altogether a picnic. The ideal was serious, was seriously believed. But, it, it, it you know, this is not easy to do yeah. to create community. You can't, you know, you're, you're, you're moving against the grain of people's predispositions and, you know, inculcated assumptions about what's what in the world, and mm. and uh, you know, and so the, I mean, the culture as a whole is far more um, fragmented than it was then. I mean, just one one tip. Uh, I mean, here's this one symbolic way that it, it occurred to me some years ago. Uh, which so I went I went to the Bronx High School of Science, which was in you know the elite high school then in New York City. And, you know, I had to pass an exam to get it, get in and so on. Um, so my parents were high school teachers. My best friend's uh, father was a printer. Uh, his mother was a school secretary. My other best friend, my, my next best friend, I guess, was a shoe salesman. Um, and, you know, and, uh, that was in lower grades. Uh, and then at, at Bronx Science, I had friends whose parents, you know, were salesmen, a doctor, two two of them doctors, you know, and we were all going to the same school. Okay. That's that's right. the thing. Okay. <laughs> we all went to the same oh. school. Yeah. I mean, our and our living conditions, you know, were not that different. I, I mean, the because the the income scale, you know, a, a doctor's income was not that much higher than the income of a high school teacher. Mm. I mean, it's, that's hard to believe, isn't it? Um, second thing that's uh, really important has to do with residential segregation. Um, you know, I lived in a neighborhood that was, you know, middle class, lower middle class. There were a lot of working class people in it. There were, you know, professionals. Um, and I'm sure there were doctors. I mean, my doctor's office was, you know, very modest. My dentist's office was very, very modest. Um, Today, residential segregation is such oh. that uh, people are growing up with people that are demographically like them. Mm. We're, we're grow people are growing up in bubbles. You know, so, so much, so much of 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 wealth and poverty is cl is clustered into zip codes. Mm. And so the 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 objective basis, if you will, for community has been damaged. I mean. Um, you know, the three princ there were three main institutions that were, uh, that broke down class uh, and, and race division. And uh, one I just mentioned, public schools. Mm -hmm. Second was public transportation. You still see it in New York. You still see people of lots of class levels on the subway, but you also, you know, there were those who were going around and used to go around in stretch limousines and others not, but still, that was the second. And the third was the military. And the military was a great force for equality. Uh, whoever you were, you know, when you were, you know, whatever your class background, you uh, were in the same basic training. And, you know, that was a transforming experience for people I knew who, 
who uh, volunteered, uh, you know, to uh, you know, uh, at some point before the Vietnam War, um, it it uh, it was a democratic experience, small d democratic experience. We don't have those now. I mean, my students, most of my students at Columbia, uh, have gone to private schools. Um, you know, whatever their color or, or or you know ethnic background, they they're privileged kids. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I'm not knocking them. I'm just, I'm just describing sociologically mm. that they, they, uh, their community is a smaller one. Uh, not because of anybody's effort to make it so, but because they live in segregated worlds. So you mentioned uh, you went to Bronx Science. So we have a Bronx connection. My grandmother went to Walton High, oh. and uh, okay. she, <laughs> father, and I think my mother uh, both taught at Walton oh. at various points. Oh. And and uh, Bella Abzug was one grade ahead of my grandmother, the great congresswoman from New York, liberal. And I said, Graham, what do you remember about Bella Abzug? She said she had a big mouth even then. <laughs> Uh, and it's interesting. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we want to uh, really keep this conversation going and be dialogical. Uh, my grandmother, who graduated Walton High, she actually was accepted to Teachers College Columbia, but her grandfather, who promised he was going to pay for it, decided to renege, and she never got to become a teacher. But... Uh, she was my teacher, and still at the age of 95, you know, I love to hear her stories. There's something about the Bronx, there's something about New York that has that, that well, charisma, that character. That romantic yeah, about yeah, that, because okay. I lived in an all-white community, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? I lived in a, in, a, in a private housing development that had been built by Metropolitan Life uh, called Parkchester, and it, they also built uh, Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, mm. and they had restrictive clauses. I mean, they uh, people had to fight in the early 60s during the Civil Rights Movement to break down racial segregation. So, you know, it, yeah, it was... Mm. <laughs> that that world was also, you know, deeply segregated. I mean, I, I, mean, I never saw, uh, you know, black people uh, except, um, uh, you know, when I came downtown or uh, on or on the subway uh, or a housekeeper. You said something that intrigued me. You wrote about this conflict between celebrity and intellectual life. Maybe, were you talking about on the left that we shouldn't deify people? Is that... Does that make any sense? Or yeah, well, I this whole fame culture? What's going on with the culture of fame today? Well, it's... Uh, I mean, good God. I mean, we have a... A potential president who is a uh, who's uh, <laughs> he's a reality TV star. I mean, that's how that's that's where he comes from, um, and and there he has accumulated an audience of people who just love the opportunity to to identify vicariously with a guy whose most famous mm -hmm. statement is "You're fired." Right? I mean, that's, right. I mean, wow, what a recommendation. So, I mean, I don't want to put this all on, you know, me media are not external to the lives people live. And they work, media work, because they generate uh, a kind of emotion that people can uh, f find themselves in. And, and they're quite good at, at, creating the cement that holds people to uh, kind of hero worship, you know. Oh, oh, I could do that. I can dance with the stars. I could, uh, you know, I can hang out with the Kardashians. I can do this or that. And he, Donald Trump, he's a loudmouth like me. Well, I'm a loudmouth too, maybe, you know. So, um, so yeah, this confusion of politics and celebrity is not new, mm. and the '60s produced one version of it. Thus, the emergence of Ronald Reagan, mm. uh, who represented an earlier age of television. I mean, he became yeah. renowned as a television figure far more than he was as a movie star. He was actually a lesser mm. movie star, and and his career didn't go that well. But as a host. Uh, on the General Electric Theater, where he was also a right-wing shill, uh, he stood for a certain uh, 
uh, accessible majesty. Oh, and then, and then we had other figures um, who came out of the media world. Uh, of course, in, it's a long story in L.A. Yeah. I, I mean, in in California, you know, whether it was Shirley Temple or or you know George Murphy, who was senator for many years, right wing, former tap you know dancer. Um, uh, and and now you know the 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 diffusion now now we have a different media uh, configuration so we have different kinds of people but the the left you know the left and the right both mm. okay have uh, been dazzled by uh, individual performance mm. uh, and so you know in a, in a horrific way I mean Hitler is mm. one stream. Uh, and you know, and Franco in Spain, and uh, various figures in Latin American history, but the left has been uh, prone to the same sort of thing. I mean, the exaltation of the monster Stalin for for decades uh, by communists and fellow travelers, and then you know we saw some of this in the '60s, the the hero worship of Huey Newton who was not an admirable character, but who was prettied up in left-wing mm. propaganda. Uh, the exaltation of Che Guevara, who was actually rather a Stalinist, but was sort of celebrated as a free spirit, it still is. They don't know what he stood for as a, as a minister of, I believe it was trade or industry in Cuba, which was not, not warm and gentle and communitarian and sitting around in a circle. Uh, and you know, and then, and, and so we've, we've, we, so look, I think it's human, frankly, for people to cave in uh, when they feel, when they've somehow transferred some part of themselves into an exalted figure and uh, it's sort of in worship that figure as some sort of idealized version of themselves. And uh, which is always extremely dangerous. So yes, in the 60s, this was quite troubling in the movement um, because you had people, so the movement had an anti-authoritarian uh, uh, bias. It, it didn't like leadership. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, Just real quick, because when you said when you became the president of the SDS, you did it very reluctantly because nobody wanted to be a leader. That's correct. That's correct. And so, you know, in the middle of the anti-war movement, SDS decided it didn't want to have a president anymore. For example, I mean, that's just typical. Uh, you know, don't follow leaders. Watch the parking meters. So, uh, so then you had an odd situation. You had people who emerged from the movement. Uh, as um, who became uh, anointed as uh, celebrities by media, mm. Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, um, to some degree Tom Hayden at a certain point. So you were caught in a whipsaw. Mm. You were um, um, the movement was suspicious of you because you were a leader. So, um, and the media were not particularly discriminating about who was actually a leader, because they wanted people who looked colorful and photogenic, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and so, uh, so there was a lot of that sort of thing. And it, so it's a very dangerous game to let the media do that. By the way, there was a very strong reaction against that tendency uh, after the 60s, which led to the rise of what in Occupy Wall Street was called horizontalism. That is, you don't have any leaders at all, which is also uh, ineffective. It's it's a it's a it's a bad substitute for hero worship. It feels like we're just beginning here, and we're at the closing of the hour. Uh, a wonderful, enriching uh, hour of dialogue with uh, Todd Gitlin, who's one of the leading intellectuals in the world, and certainly one of the leaders of the intellectual left in the 60s, continuing to go strong uh, as a professor at uh, Columbia, chair of the communications department. Your students are very lucky to have you, sir. We're very lucky to have you on our show today, and there's always more to say. I hope you'll come back and continue this dialogue. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you.